is it's really mindfulness mindfulness in Islam. But um, one thing is that oftentimes, especially in a society that we're living in, everybody is talking about mindfulness, but the mindfulness that they're talking about is really coming from a pagan standpoint with Eastern religions. And that's where everybody in most of the American universities right now are talking about it in a way where it's all about some kind of a universal energy that is affecting the people and that's controlling the masses. And without them recognizing, they're actually adopting this idea and really not recognizing that it actually contradicts the ABCs of Tawheed in Islam. That's why when we actually talk about mindfulness, it's important to remember and mention that the word mindfulness in Eastern religions has its own understanding. So I just wanted to, I guess, you know, use the mindfulness from a literal standpoint and not necessarily the mindfulness that is talked about in Eastern religions. And what I mean by that is the mindfulness in yoga or the mindfulness in Hinduism or the mindfulness in Taoism or et cetera. So we're definitely not at all going, uh, going to adopt their idea or even their vision of mindfulness. Now, mindfulness, the word itself, it's really, you know, putting a different kind of a focus. And in Islam, there is something similar in the mindfulness, or at least in the focus. Uh, there are certain things that you could see in different religions and Islam that may have some similarities. Um, perhaps maybe because some of those religions did initially have probably a divine state, but at the end of the day, we don't have any evidence to prove that they actually did have a divine um, state or a divine uh, revelation. But we do see that some things do actually have certain similarities between Islam, Christianity, and probably other religions as well. But definitely I'm not going to come from that point and say, well, this is Islam's understanding of mindfulness and we're adopting the same thing and we're the same thing. And therefore, let's just really um, be part of this type of universalism? Absolutely not. Islam is actually is not an Eastern cultural practice and certainly is not a Western cultural practice. It is distinguished. It's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we actually take from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically not based on dhan and not based on hawa and only based on wahi. It's not based on speculation. It's not based on desire, and it's only based on revelation. But there are certain things that we do see that the mindfulness, or at least the dhikr, now I'm going to replace, instead of the word mindfulness, I'm going to use dhikr. Because in Islam, the word mindfulness, the way that Eastern religions would actually uh, adopt the meaning, is totally different than Islam. Because in Islam, the word dhikr is often the word to replace, whether we're talking about a dhikr in mental focus, or whether we're talking about dhikr in oral repetition, or whether we're talking about dhikr in behavior. Now, these things are really important to talk about because what we usually don't what we usually don't see is that people mentioning or at least Muslims recognizing that dhikr is not a Sufi term but is actually a Quranic term. It certainly was not talking about something that is Sufi. In fact, it was literally saying verily by the mentioning and the remembrance and the repetition of the name of the Lord Almighty, don't the hearts feel that tranquility and that contempt? Now, that's why when we actually talk about dhikr, we do see that there's um, in, in the Quran, there's the part where it talks about a visual dhikr, then there's the oral dhikr, and where there's a type of dhikra. The word dhikr or dhikra in Lu Arabiya actually means one, it can mean to remember mentally. To remember something, 
actually means dhakara actually means to regain the memory of something. Dhakara can also mean dhakara smashe or dhakara uh, can also mean to remember or at least to speak and repeat orally. Now, there's also dhakara in terms of behavior. So we do have in where there is financial dhikr, social dhikr, whatever different kinds of behaviors that you might uh, adopt can also be a form of dhikr. Making dhikr farther than just a, a word of remembrance, but it's actually an idea that you have in your mind that affects your tongue, that affects your behavior, and therefore that makes an identity. Now, this is important to remember because in Islam, Islam is more than just a name. It is an identity. That's why even when Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam, when Prophet Nuh, alayhi salam, he cried out to his Lord and said, in Nabini min ahli. My son is actually part of my family, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, min ahli. He's not from your family. Why? The behavior is not a pious behavior. I warn you from being part of those that are jahileen. Jahileen. Well, the word jahiliya is supposed to mean ignorant. But this is not to actually mean ignorant, where the person is uneducated to mean that they don't have a university degree. But no, this is actually saying that, well, I warn you from revisioning or visioning the world based on the terms of not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but based on the terms that is common between the people that are not adopting as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being their orbit. Now, what does that actually mean? That actually tells us that in Islam, even the way you identify family, you identify yourself, you identify relations, you identify financial relations, you identify right, wrong, human rights, any rights, whatever it is, justice, the list goes on and on, is supposed to be centered around Allah's Prantana. It's exactly like you would have an orbit for any atom. When you look at the atoms, you've got the electrons, the protons, the neutrons, you've got, that's what the atom actually contains. But the electrons, the closer they are to the nucleus, the stronger the gravity. And of course, when they start losing part of their electrons, they basically become a totally different element, or at least a different compound, a different chemistry. In other words, it actually changes its own identity. The identity becomes a new identity, and that's the same thing. In where your identity is really determined based on what your basis is, what your foundation is, what your center is. What is your center? Is your center Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is your center Quran and Sunnah? What is your center? Or is your center dunya? Or is your center Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the majority, the masses, they would either follow a one speculation or they might follow their own whims. Today, it's basically the lobbying. Idhan is basically right now what is presented, the speculation is where what is presented as if it was the recent studies had proven such and such, when in reality, it's nothing but a theory. But then it will be presented to you as if it was the final thing that man's ideas and man's research or man's intellect had reached, manipulating the masses, that it's basically smart in the only smart way to do things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things easier for you and tells you, well, you're going to be either seeing ma the masses following a dhan, speculation, not introducing it as speculation, but introducing it as if it was the smart way of doing things. 
وما تهوى الأنفس or what the whims desire what their own desires had actually wanted to lay out to make it as the, the common practice and which is right now what is presented whether it's in the media or whether it's in political lobbying and the list goes on and on but what majority doesn't recognize and especially here in america is that they don't recognize how this society and especially the american slash western society how they had actually evolved from being theocentric to being homocentric to being with no centricity in other words to being living in a society where it's all about absurdity all about absurdity is the society that is right now presented to us as if it is the society of intellect the society of intelligence the society of science without us recognizing once we just adopt an idea and we don't scrutinize where these ideas are coming from we too will be following the same footsteps as those that had actually preceded us. What were they? Well, they were basically pagans. The pagans, the, the, those that had actually followed the religion of their ancestors, thinking that, that that's what brought civilization. And of course, the best way to introduce such ideas is through a narrative. It's exactly the way and nothing new whatsoever in where even Fir'aun, he wanted to introduce the idea through a narrative. What did he say? Fir'aun, this person that was actually doing in ordering for the mass killing of young babies and young children right now, presenting himself as if he was the person to be the savior for the society. He cries out in order to gain the masses votes, the masses support. He says about Prophet Musa, I fear that he will change your religion and change the principles that you have been long living by and through it you had introduced this great civilization. So he presents himself, I fear that he will change your religion, your principles, the ideas that had made the civilization possible. Or I fear that Musa will bring in an injustice. What injustice? Weren't you the first one to actually bring all that injustice? No, the best way to manipulate the masses, to make them think that you are the one to be the person of patriotism, the person of justice, is by accusing others of committing injustices. That way, you can present yourself as if you are anti-injustice and pro-justice, manipulating the masses. And that's exactly what we're living in today. A society that is based on narrative, that is based on emotions, that is based on manipulating the masses under the banner and under the motto that it is a society of intellect, thought, and critical thinking. When in reality, it's actually only criticizing when, uh, when it wants to criticize others. But the second that you criticize that thought, you will be called the homophobe. You will be called backwards, traditionalists. The list goes on and on with the different names. Without you recognizing, you would be afraid to speak up you would be afraid to stand and voice anything but the opinions that they want to indoctrinate the masses in. Now that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for us to understand where we go, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, well, the first place that I want you to focus on is really 
before we talk about any idea, I want you to recognize your place of focus, your foundation of truth. Your foundation of truth is really none other but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the center of interest and activity. And of course, the other ideas, they would also consider that the, the place of focus is really their own way. But for a Muslim, the place of focus is centered around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The practice of it, the practicality of it is the purpose of life. The purpose of life that actually preceded your existence. In other words, it's not the existentialist type of philosophy. What is that? The existentialist type of philosophy suggests that you create your own purpose. Not that the purpose preceded your existence. You create your purpose of life. Islam tells you no. Your purpose preceded your existence and not the other way around. Your purpose should actually be compatible with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created for you and the reason for your life before you even existed. Number three, and the actual matter that you do in this life is related to your purpose of life. Now, this is important because when we actually speak, can you push the chair forward, please? When you actually speak of purpose in life, when you speak in purpose in life, it's really important to remember that it must be compatible with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created your life for. In other words, there's no way that you can actually make a purpose or invent a purpose. Because when your eye was created, it didn't all of the sudden think of a purpose for it, which is seeing. As a matter of fact, the idea of seeing preceded the making of your eye. The idea of hearing preceded the making of your ear. The idea of life preceded life itself. Therefore, there is no way that you could actually create your own purpose or say, this is my mission in life. The mission must be compatible with what you were created for before you even existed, before even life has, had existed. The other part, in where when we're speaking about focus. Of course, we move on in life in different ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in life you had been created, but am hasibtum an tadkhulu al-jannata wa lamma ya'tikum mathal alladhi naqalahu min qablikum. Did you think you were going to enter jannah? when you didn't actually get through or go through the different challenges that had happened or that the people before you and the people that had lived before you had went through, there's no way for every single test in order to gain the elevation for your test, you must first prove that you have past the different stages for that test. And that's why in focus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that dhikr is your way to help you go through those stages in where it's from looking at pain to another point, focusing instead of them, focusing on your body or senses, it's actually focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's redirecting. Now it's really important to mention that right now, what we're seeing with all that rise of the mental illness, I'm not here generalizing and saying mental illness does not exist. Absolutely not. No, there are those that really need the therapy. There are those that really need treatment. This is not at all to actually say it doesn't exist. But this is to say 
that in a society that is centered around atheism, right now, mental illness is at many times commercialized as the alternative to dhikr, the alternative to connecting to God Almighty. And then what you end up is all and most of the people, because they had turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're right now in need for therapists to redirect their focus all the time. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, you've got the right there, the therapist with you. I complain, my sorrow, my pains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that is the true therapy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is redirecting us, redirecting our focus to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that's not enough. There is the repetition in order for you to get into that redirection of your focus. Repetition is crucial to help you maintain that connection in your focus, that connection with your ability to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course detaching detaching yourself from the busy life now here's one thing right now the society is introducing as an alternative to all of us things like yoga to de detach you from the busy life things where you're repeating different things i'm smart i'm smart i'm smart and the list goes on and on as a way really an alternative to what the religion itself was presenting right now we're living in a society that in order to totally abandon religion right now they're presenting the motivational speakers as an alternative and without us recognizing it's actually an agenda to separate the society from religion to nothing but a materialistic life how does islam actually bring the focus number one repetition la ilaha illallah memorizing al quran now repetition in general is in itself dhikr that's why morning adhkar the the, the adhkar the masa adhkar the night adhkar and abstaining from external and internal forces what do we mean by that let's stop at this word for a little bit this is extremely important because the society right now is insisting on presenting that you can live as you want and the way you live your liberal life has no impact on your religion because religion is supposed to, according to that thinking, religion is not supposed to have any say over morality. Religion is just supposed to be a moment within a masjid, a synagogue, or a church. Outside of that, religion should not have any impact. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually tells us that no. Everything is bima kasabat aidik. What you look at, what you what you listen to, what you say, all the different things that you relate to within the society. That's at the end, a force that is going to affect you. What you what you wear, what you listen to, what you hear, what you say, what you look at, what you eat, what you drink. What you smell, all of that, those are external, but that's not enough. Even the internal ones. On the inside, are you making your dhikr? What are they doing? They're thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or are they thinking about envying somebody? Or are they thinking about dunya? Or are they thinking about probably doing different things and where on the inside they're distancing themselves away? That 
is going to take their ability to focus, but that's not enough. Because you can think that you know all the different details to help you think, but the reality is you as a human being, there is no way that you can separate yourself totally and be totally subjective in your judgment on things because you can never be subjective away and totally separated from probably your history, probably your sex, probably your age, and the list goes on and on. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the sharia in order to help guide you for you to be able to sift those external forces and internal forces that will affect your ability to focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point of focus in Islam, number one, it's basically in order to gain the attention and see the magnificence of the Lord Almighty in your own self. Two, in seeing that the world around you in every single force, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, Lahu maqalidu samawati wa The second that you feel that you're failing, the second that you feel that everything is going against you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, Lahu maqalidu samawati wa He is the one that is in control over every single force in the heavens and on earth. In every single direction that you look, the Lord Almighty, Allah Almighty, is the true force that's controlling everything. Why? In order for you to recognize that what you invest, it's either going to be an effort, an energy, that's really a lost energy or an energy that's going to come back to you. What energy? We're not talking about the energy that they're talking about right now in the, the, different, the different religions or the different um, Eastern religions. We're not talking about that type of energy, but we're actually talking about how it comes back to you. In where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, all the different things that you have around you were given to you. You might be given beauty. You might be given intelligence. You might be given money. You might be given different types of, different types of powers, forces, whatever it is you want to call it. At the end of the day is that you didn't actually get it just because you seem to be lucky. You were given that power. You were given that privilege to be tested. If you happen to have beauty, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you happen to have intelligence, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you happen to have money, it's not by your intelligence. It's actually by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa razzaq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa al-mu'iz. If you happen to have some kind of an opportunity, you became the CAO or something or something like that. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa al-mu'iz. Huwa al -mudhil. So now, it's redirecting that every single privilege that you might have, you would attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to yourself. Why? Because it's redirecting your focus to recognize that if it wasn't by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would actually not be capable of giving yourself any privilege. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's redirecting your focus from thinking about yourself to thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, that's not only in the privileges, but that's also in the purpose of life. In the purpose of life, in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the one glory beyond to the Lord Almighty who actually has all the ownership of everything 
and he's capable of doing all that he wants. The one that created life and death. Even death is a creature. Yes, death is a creature, as life is a creature. In other words, you're actually in the hands in both your life and your death as really controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The whole thing about life is really to test you which of you is going to be the one getting the highest point in Jannah at the end of the day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you from seeing yourself as the place of focus to seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From seeing that you are the one in control of everything in your life. You might think if I would study hard, I would get to getting good grades. If I basically am smart enough, I would get a job. If I was pretty enough and I managed to make myself beautiful enough, I would attract those guys and they would be right there racing and chasing me in order to get married to me. I'd basically get the privileges of getting the best opportunities in life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, think again. Don't look at yourself as being the force and certainly don't look at the universe as being the force. It's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the actual force that's actually controlling everything. And he is the place and the point of change. That's why three things stand on Tawheed. Number one, faith in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, pay attention to this one. Faith in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two is faith in Asma Allah and Asma al Sifat. Is faith in the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot be a Muslim unless the Prophet actually said, Inna lillahi tis. How many? Tis'un wa tis'un asma. Man ahsaha dakhala al jannah. You mention, you believe in those names, you adopt those names, you have those names right in your mind and you act upon them. Dakhala al jannah. You enter jannah. It's not an issue of al Malik al Qudus al Salam al Mu'min al Muhammad al Aziz al Jabba. It's not remembering those names only, but it's actually living them. It's feeling them. It's internalizing them. It's recognizing the magnificence of the Lord Almighty's names in every single corner of where your eye might see and what your ear might hear. That's why when we actually remember and do the dhikr, we repeat the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we repeat the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is the main foundation for the third type of Tawheed, Al-Ubudiyya, Tawheed Al-Ibadah, Tawheed Al-Ubudiyya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Tawheed, you're submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a third type of Tawheed. What does it mean? You're taking the moment to do your repetition, to do that dhikr. Why? In order to enhance your focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you do? Well, when we're talking about dhikr, it's actually a crucial thing to, in order to clear and sharpen your focus to do one, number one, salah. Two, dhikr, dhikr sabah, adhkar sabah, adhkar al masah, and to actually do that Quran recitation. Why Quran? Because the Quran with the 6,236 ayat, they are taking you one. There's a lot of history in the Quran. Why? Because it's telling you, listen, in order for you to see your future, I want you to look at the past. This is how the story of the dhikr started. How do you continue your part? You are simply supposed to be tracing back the history of that dhikr, the mission, the revelation that all the prophets and the messengers had actually come with. This is how the story started, the story of the dhikr. How do you continue your story? How do you continue that story, the story of the dhikr? And of course, 
الله سبحانه وتعالى تورد ولا قد يسرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مذكر قرآن was made easy to read, repeat, memorize why فهل من مذكر it's not an issue of just reading it but it's an issue for Hanmin Mudekir. Is someone going to take it to contemplate on the words, to take the words in consideration, to remember the words? Because with the Quran, yeah, yes, there is the part about history, but only from the 6,236 ayat, only approximately 700 ayat are related to legislature. The rest are related to aqeedah. The rest are related to aqeedah. The rest are related to creed. The rest are related in where it's to sharpen your focus. How do you see the world? How do you see your existence? How do you recognize, well, not only the past, but how do you build your future based on the idea that your existence, your purpose preceded your existence? And that's why what you say affects your heart what you repeat and what you vibrate in your tongue at the end of the day will vibrate into your heart, my dear. And at the same time, at the end of the day, when you repeat, it affects your focus and it affects your behavior. And at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innam al -mu'minun. What about them? The true mu'mineen. Alladheena idha dhukir Allahu wajilat kulubuhum. Those that when they remember the name of the Lord Almighty, their, heart, their hearts tremble. Why? Because they just did the thicket in their mouth, but the mu'min is different. The mu'min doesn't just let the words just be uttered in their mouth. The mu'min lets the words vibrate into their heart. But then what? وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ and when the words of the Lord Almighty are mentioned and they are reminded of the words of the Lord Almighty, what happens to them? They would depend on the Lord Almighty. Why? Because what the Quran contains is a lot of redirection to your focus. It's redirecting your focus from seeing yourself as the one to be in control of all the different things in the world, to seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to recognizing the magnificence of Allah Almighty, to recognizing that Allah Almighty is the one that you turn to, to recognizing that He truly deserves for His magnificence. They take the moment to actually do their salah. Why? Because with salah, it contains more than just a repetition. It actually contains a redirection of focus. What does it have to do with anything? Why is it that the Quran or Islam actually tells us that we're supposed to spend the money? I thought I put the energy to make the money. Shouldn't I be the one having the right to spend the money, use the money? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, listen, you want to gain better in akhlaq. You got to learn how to approach and adopt the philosophy of giving up on things. Giving up on things what does that even mean? One of the main illnesses that we live in our society today is one word. A taraf. A taraf. Luxury. What is luxury? When you look at the salihin, they would always speak of tazkiya and zud. What is Tazkiya and Zul? If you look at the whole idea of Tazkiya and Zul in Islam, in order for you to increase your Iman, you would increase in Siyam. You would increase in Sadaqah. You would increase 
in giving up on dunya. Why? Because once you give up on dunya, you learn that there's something more valuable than what you had given up on. You give up on money, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you another type of tazkiyah. Why? Because what you're teaching your brain and what you're teaching your subconscious mind, I'm giving up on dunya. Why? Because the akhirah is more valuable. I'm giving up on food. Why? Because I want to eat from akhirah. I want to eat from Jannah. I'm giving up on so many different things. That's why the major illness that we're living in this life is taraf, is luxury, is really just an increase in trying to change our appearance trying to change and expand our homes more and more and upgrading phones, upgrading cars, upgrading this and without us recognizing we're living in a race to upgrade our dunya. And that's why the Muslims are actually going behind, not forward. Because if you wanted to race with the kuffar, this is al dunya sijnu al mu'min wa jannatu al kafir. But if the Muslimin right now are racing for more and more dunya, who are you racing with? Bob? John? Steve? Molly? <clears throat> Michelle? If you're going to race with her, you're going to start to have to give up, give up on your akhirah. And without us recognizing, we're seeing right now Muslimat, Muslimat, racing, puffing, certain body parts, expanding. And in order to get more of dunya, let's go for a mortgage. Why? Riba, because I have to, because we had created necessities not because they are necessities but because we had created necessities because right now we're living in a race with a taraf the whole idea of islam in order to connect you with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is give up on dunya give up on your food when we actually see that is Sayyid Aisha had said that the first bid'ah was obesity. The first bid'ah was obesity. Why? Because when the Muslimin had started getting into that gluttony, wanting more food, then they want more dunya. Once they get into wanting more dunya, they start giving up on more akhirah. There's no way that you can have two parts, two focuses. You're either focusing on a dunya or an akhira. Either focusing on a dunya or an akhira. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was always emphasizing. Those are the true believers. Why? Because they gave up on dunya. Because they want the akhira. And then what? Those are the ones that basically seek a different level of elevation. They are the ones that would get different increase in elevation. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله
to get the focus. That's why Islam focuses on also warning you of what might actually be a distraction. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ordering us to get our tongues busy with mentioning the dhikr. But how do we actually do that? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching us to, st to stay away from speaking about other sins or speaking about your own sins or even your own pain. Stop right there. The Prophet ﷺ, during a time, it was Eid. Supposed to be a day of celebration. But the Prophet ﷺ tells the women, I had seen most of you in hellfire. Most of those that are dwelling in hellfire were women. One of the Sahabi had said, what makes us be the most to dwell in hellfire? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Because you constantly damning th things around you. And and you would deny any good contribution that would given to you, that would be given to you. What does that mean? We know scientifically that women are actually more prone to going through anxiety and depression than men, whether due to hormonal changes or whether due to her own physical, sometimes weakness in where she feels that I can't get things done. The idea of feeling like a victim is something that we constantly see in women, where she's living in the idea that she's the victim of her own self, victim of her husband, victim of her family, a victim of the society, a victim, a victim of the whole society, and everyone is just not giving her the opportunity. If it was only left to her, she would have been capable of doing everything and not recognizing that, listen, Complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stop living the idea that you're a victim. Because once that takes over you, you would find yourself to you would you will find yourself constantly to constantly damning the things around you, constantly complaining that you're nothing but a victim. Islam was telling the women, the Prophet was telling the women that in order to shift their focus, get yourself out of the idea that you're a victim, whether a victim because of your family or whether a victim because of your society or whether a victim because of your body or whether a victim of whatever, get yourself out of that taboo that you're not a victim. Get yourself out of that idea. And always having that negative eye. No one's helping me. I'm the one that's doing everything. And then what do they end up doing? They would deny that anybody has helped them in any way. And then why? Well, because the idea of it being a victim is constantly... I would say monitoring them, controlling them. And that's why 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he tells us, that's a word. When he had quoted from Prophet Yaqub, say, I complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't complain to people. Don't complain to your friends. Because when you constantly complain to your friends, your friends are going to start and the people around you, they're going to start defining you based on your weakness and based on the challenges and not based on the successes. You end up the person to bring in those that will insult and assault you. You brought it to yourself because you were constantly complaining the different perpetrators thought that you would be an easy victim for them to prey on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to get az. Don't complain to anyone. Only complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because I want you to be a woman of izzah. Because I want you to be a woman of honor. Because I want you to be a woman that would never be defined based on your weaknesses. But based on your izzah. Based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was basically always telling us all these different things. Who is going to be the ones to be successful? Those that are practicing khushua in their salah. Once they learn how to focus, those are the people that they learn and they teach themselves how to stay away from the different kinds of lahu, whether it's talking about their sins or talking about other people's sins or whether it's talking about the different complaints or it's whether it's just wasting your time speaking of nonsense. They're actually going to learn how to stay away from all of that. How do they contribute? They learn how to give that zakah. They learn how to give that found that, that that contribution because they want the akhirah, not the dunya. And that's why they would be capable of guarding their private parts, and they would be capable of living their iman, speaking about dunya in general. It's basically lahu in itself. That's lahu without you recognizing. You would not find the time to do the dhikr if you're actually busy speaking about all these different areas. That's why shifting the focus from the negative to positive focus in Islam is a very important thing because Islam wants it to be strong. So he tells you, five minutes, okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you, instead of focusing on guilt, what do you focus on? Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for maghfirah. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you from focusing on pain. Allahumma anta shafi. Don't focus on the pain. Focus Allah on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability Allah to give you shifa. That's Allahu Akbar. From focusing on the trauma to, so, to focusing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that's capable of changing the trauma that you're living in to give you the compensation and giving you the power from failure to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gives you the success. That's why we would re repeat and remember the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's yeah. all about shifting from looking at your situation to looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one that's capable of changing your situation. After salah, we're going to continue or did you want me to leave? Okay, inshallah. What does Izzah mean? Izzah. Izzah, honor. Yep. Honor. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil
ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فأوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أنقض ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله 
Allah Akbar. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله So inshallah, we're, we're just going to continue really quick. So the whole thing about focus in, in Islam, in other words, the dhikr is really focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, focusing that Allah, instead of looking at failure and we and weakness, but to shifting your focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. Rather than focusing on your own pain, focusing on Allahumma anta shafi, Focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the one that's capable of giving the treatment. Instead of focusing on your failure, focusing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is the one that is capable of giving you victory or giving you success. From looking at yourself to looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From looking at yourself to bringing and making the change. In other words, in Islam, to actually say believe in yourself is actually haram. That's kufur. <laughs> because it's believe in Allah, not believe in yourself. Because whatever privileges you have, you are not necessarily going to be believing in yourself that you gave them to yourself. 
you believe in Allah, not in yourself. I know that the way that they would present it to mean believe in yourself, in other words, have confidence in yourself, but the whole wording of believing in yourself actually comes from the Eastern religions. <laughs> <clears throat> where it's all about you have an internal force that makes the change in the universe and even the, in, uh, globally. In Islam, no, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's force, not your force, not the universe's force, and certainly not the force within, within the materialistic things. Because when you actually look at atheists, they no, would I consider... Quick announcement uh, for the sisters in the Mahat class, they can take part in the uh, sisters' halaqa for the remainder of the halaqa, inshallah. The sisters in the Ulum al Quran uh, halaqa. Okay. So the, the whole idea, for example, for the atheists, they would consider that the whole world is nothing but matter in motion. Matter in motion. In other words, everything is just matter. In Islam, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is actually the force behind everything in this whole universe. So therefore, in Islam, it's all about focusing on Allah's power rather than your weakness, focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power to heal with, or, or even to actually focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you any shift, whether shifting your from looking at the materialistic things to focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the power. And of course, that's why when you actually look at the different parts of Tawheed, I'm not going to focus so much on, on all of that because I want to give time for you guys to um, ask the questions. So in, in Islam, focusing on yourself. What happened? The malaika themselves, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the malaika that I'm going to create another creation, the other creation, the malaika, they thought, are you going to create something that is going to cause a destruction on earth and going to cause bloodshed? Certainly, this was not talking about the jinn because jinn don't even have blood. That's another story. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he said, They actually wanted to say, well, what would actually be the main reason for any creation? We do the tasbih, we do the dhikr, in other words, we're doing what is necessary as part of our own creation. So what else would this creature be capable of doing? But that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically told them that this creature actually has something that you don't actually have. In other words, you're not equipped with, which is intellect. You have an, he's this Adam has an intellect that is capable of making a choice to do or not do. That's why he said, He taught Adam in order to show the malaika, you've got the intellect. This creature has the intellect and also has the free will, but this free will is exactly what they're going to be tested in. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what happened? This amana, this trust, this free will to, cho to choose to do or not do. Adam was the only creature that was given this. Adam to mean human beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know that the reason for our creation was the purpose that preceded our existence to be tested. Two, for this test, you were given free will. Three, you were also given the intellect to choose to do and recognize what's right and what's wrong. So what's the most important thing for me to do in recognizing my center for the purpose of life. One, recognizing your creator. Two, 
recognizing how you relate to your creator. Three, you recognize that the creator himself is basically through his names. He is a Razak. He is the one to give victory. He is a Nasr. He is the one. Why all of these? Because man recognizes that he's got some weaknesses. Man, the first thing you, that you actually do when you're first born is cry. That's the first thing you do. <clears throat> Why? Because you recognize your weakness. You recognize your hunger. The second weakness, you recognize your fear. Fear, hunger, and all of a sudden, what just happened? Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, well, in order for you to recognize yourself, you first have to start recognizing the foundation of what made you who you are. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the person doesn't recognize Allah, then they don't recognize themselves. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nasullaha fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them forget their own selves. Right now, they can't even figure out whether they're male and female. Nasullaha fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They even forgot how to tell the difference between male and female. Ansahum anfusahum. They forgot Allah, so they forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them forget themselves. Shaitan. They forgot themselves. They can't even recognize male, female, who they are, what they are, what they should be. Now they're turning into self-identifying dogs and cats. What next? What next? They forgot that they're even human. They forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you cannot identify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will not be capable of identifying who you are. Simple. You won't be able to identify who you are. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was always telling us to turn to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing the dhikr because that is how you grow in recognizing your identity. That's how you shift from living a materialistic life and thinking that life is matter in motion to recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you for a purpose, created you and gave you the intellect to live an identity, to live a vision. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling you, listen, don't focus on this dunya, but focus on the akhirah. Practicing your salah from focusing on your body instead of focusing on your body and trying to huff and puff and enlarge different areas or, or probably minimize certain areas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your suwar, does not look at your appearance. But he looks at your hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you Focus on the inside. Focus on the akhlaq, not the, not, the, not the creation, because you didn't even create yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you to focus and practice by focusing on, one, training and fasting. Training in how you relate with the world around you and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted you, even when it comes to family. إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٍ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِهِ why? He's not, he's not from your family. <inaudible> Wanted you to reshift your focus from looking at money to looking at what is halal, to connecting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from focusing on your appearance to focusing on what matters in akhlaq. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was ordering you to lower your gaze or even do hijab or reduce spending on dunya to actually looking at focusing on your, your iman. And of course, in order to do that, it's really to shift you from looking at things from a natural negative feeling. That's how it would generate in you the positive feelings and wanting the akhirah, not the dunya. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching us the most important thing for a believer is really 
their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their akhlaq. The Prophet وسلم, and I actually said about the about the Muslim, al Muslim wa akhul Muslim. A believer is a brother to another believer. Why? Because it was building a new foundation of how we relate with one another. A believer is a brethren to another believer. They would not betray them. They would not in whatsoever way. They would not create lies. They would not create lies or they would not somehow manipulate them. But they would, a Muslim would recognize the sanctity of their brother, Muslim brothers, chastity, their Muslim brothers, wealth and property, and even their reputation and their life. Because at the end of the day, is that that's the true akhlaq. That's the true akhlaq. And at the end, is that all of it is really shifting it from looking at the world as if it was just a natural reaction to the different things to actually recognizing that it's your spirit, it's your tazkiyah that will have an impact. That's why Allah subhanahu wa says, Kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahina. Every single person. It's your own self. It's your own akhlaq. It's your own deen. It's whatever force that you had actually made from the inside to your focus, to your words, to your gaze, all of that at the end of the day, that's what's going to affect the life that you're going to be living in, in this dunya and even in the akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us from looking at the reaction to a new action of principle. You want me to stop? Five, five. five minutes? Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ taught us لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِالطَّعَانِ وَلَا اللَّعَانِ وَلَا الْفَاحِشِ وَلَا الْبَذِيدِ That the Prophet ﷺ said that a believer does not engage in some kind of a confrontation or a reaction to things. And he said لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنَ بِالطَّعَانِ A believer is not, a, is not the one that curses the things around him. وَلَا الْفَاحِشِ and it's not the one that uses any type of a profane, profanity or any type of a low language. And certainly, why? Because they don't speak in low akhlaq. They speak in high akhlaq. And that's why they actually start shifting from a negative, beha from a negative behavior to a behavior that's focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm just going to make it really quick. I'll stop right here, inshallah, because I've got a lot of questions already right, right here, inshallah. But I do actually have this lecture also on my YouTube channel, so you could also see it. I'm just going to read some of the things. How do you keep yourself firm and ground in your deen? Yes, Salam. Let me answer this question. How do you keep yourself Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna nahnu nazzalna al-Qur'ana tanzeela. Fasbir l-hukmi rabbik. Wa la tuti' minhum athiman aw kafura. Wa adhkur isma rabbika bukratan wa asila wa min al-layli. Fasjud lahu wa sabbihu laylan tawina. Simple, it just answered the question. Inna nahnu nazzalna al-Qur'ana nahnu nazzalna Quran atanzi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed the Quran. There's your, your merkaziyya. That's your center. Quran. So how do I stay firm? Learn the Quran. Not just memorize. Learn what it's saying. Tafsir is extremely important. Because if you don't know what the tafsir, you don't know what the ayat are saying. Are you capable of actually generating a place of focus and thought and Having a philosophy that's going to affect your behavior. But that's not enough. There's no way that you can practice akhlaq until you recognize that akhlaq in Islam are based on four things. Number one, recognizing al-adl. Recognizing justice. The definition of morality. The definition of justice. Two, enduring tasbir li hukmi rabbik. Enduring patience. There's no way that you can actually live Islam unless you recognize that there is 
going to be a challenge. Tasbir. So be patient. Lihukmi Rabbik. For the orders of your Lord Almighty. There's going to be some mockery. There's going to be a challenge. But there's also going to be some that are going to offer you. You do this, you get a CV. You do this, we'll probably give you a, a scholarship. We'll probably give you a position. We'll probably increase your pay if you give up on your dean just a little bit. Show in your skirt, show in your abaya, maybe reduce your hijab, take it back a little bit, and the list goes on and on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, Fasbir hukm rabbik wala tuti'. Don't obey. And don't obey. Not somebody that is athim, not somebody that is a sinner, and not somebody that is a disbeliever. In other words, you have to select the people that surround you. Don't be friends with somebody that is ethem. If somebody is living their life based on ethem, based on masiyah, based on sin, you don't want that person. You got to select who you have around you. Or even a kafura. You can't be friends with somebody that, that is a sinner, let alone somebody that is not even Muslim. There's a difference between an acquaintance and between somebody that you would seek advice with, that you would seek different moments, that you're spending hours and hours with. They cannot be Atham or Kafur. They can't. Because you've got your vision. You've got your focus. You've got your behavior. So what should I do? When? Do your dhikr. Bukratan wa asila throughout the day and throughout the night. Wa min al-layli fasrud lahu wa sabbihu laylan tawila. You have to engage in dhikr. If you don't engage in dhikr, you're not going to be able to ground yourself in deen. What do we mean by dhikr? The most important thing about dhikr is learning your Islam. Because if you don't learn your Islam, then without you recognizing the society right now, especially right now, like never before, is actually indoctrinating the Muslims and the non-Muslims. What you guys see of America, I was born in America, okay? I was born here, right here in Minnesota. What you guys see of America right now, that's not America that I grew up in. America has shifted 180 degrees. That's not the America that I grew up in. So if you think that this, is, this means being American, you're absolutely wrong. This is not America. This is all a new indoctrination that is right now influencing the society and indoctrinating the society. This is not America. And certainly this is not Christianity. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that you got to be careful. The society right now is indoctrinating you through different agendas, whether we're talking about liberalism or whether we're talking about atheism or whether we're talking about existentialism, whether we're talking about feminism and the list goes on and on. You got to be careful. And there's no way that you're going to be able to be careful if you don't even know what it is. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us what kufr is in order to help us identify kufr to not fall in it. You want to keep your iman? You got to be able to identify what kufr is. You're not going to be able to identify what iman is if you don't know what kufr is. That's why Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was telling the Prophet he said, what would lead to Jahannam? It's not like he wanted to go there. No, he was like, I want to identify Jahannam because if I identify Jahannam, I'll be able to know that I'm safe. That's why it's really important to recognize the society right now that is indoctrinating the masses into that feminist thought, into the liberal thought, into the LGBT, into all this postmodern thought without us recognizing. You can go to my YouTube channel to actually learn more about postmodernism, feminism, and so forth. Here's another question. Is it okay to end a friendship when you stop thinking they bring good to your life? How does this apply to when our deeds are presented to Allah, but they won't be accepted until we have reconciled with them? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it okay to end a friendship when you stop thinking they bring good to your life? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll keep it later. That, um, let, let's go for the other one. The hadith 
that say whoever prays is sunnah prays, 12 sunnah prayers will guarantee you our um, house in Jannah. If you once use to do these prayers for a couple months, and then, of course, you're not able to do them anymore. So at the end of the day, even if even if you couldn't continue because, let's say, something that was that was um, getting you busy or probably something that is beyond your capacity that all of a sudden halted you from being able to do what you used to be able to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually give you the reward even though you had stopped doing them. He'll give you the reward as if you were doing them because of the external, let's call it external uh, force that somehow halted you from being able to do them. But if it's an internal thing, what do I mean by internal thing? You just started getting lazy. I would just say, hey, um, the best of the actions, like the Prophet Sallam said, are the actions, uh, even the, the actions that are, even though they are less, but adwamuha wa inqal, the ones that last longer, even if they are minimal. In other words, two rak'ahs per night is, and let's say on a longer on a longer um, time, so probably for a whole year, is better than doing one night, the whole night praying, and then never doing it again. All right, let's go for another one. Let's go to another 15 minutes. The sisters have a lot of questions. Yeah, thanks for telling me. <laughs> what is the ruling on using birth control? If your husband asks you to go on it do you have to what is the fatwa on asking out uh, on taking out loans for education so for the part about birth control um number one is that there are a number of different things in regards to birth control it's permissible to use birth control on a condition that you're not making it a permanent birth control that's number one number two is that it's a mutual a mutual thing between you and your husband that you both work out together on agreeing and consenting together. So you're not doing it as if, you know, like the feminist would want to say, this is your body, your life, and therefore your husband doesn't have the right to say in it. No, it's basically you and your husband both together. And then therefore we would basically recommend um, talking together about it, seeing the pros and the cons. Should you delay pregnancy right now? When is it the right time? Um, how much is he contributing? How much are you contributing? What, it, what does it mean to actually have another child? So that's a conversation that you would, you two together would actually talk about and certainly you don't want to do it behind his back, but you both have to do it together. Um, what is the fatwa on taking out loans for education? So um, the loans for education, it depends. First, you want to deprive all the different non-riba, non-interest methods. So whether we're talking about a scholarship or whether we're talking about different um, loans that are not riba loans, um, you first want to you first want to make sure, and we're talking about an undergrad here, you want to make sure that you um, you use all the different methods to not, to not go through riba, but then if you have no choice for an undergrad, but taking a subsidized loan, try as much as you can to work out probably a secondary job to make sure that you're going to be um, completing your payments before it's too late because you definitely don't want to go into a riba. As for graduate, uh, the graduate studies and taking a loan, uh, according to Amja and according to most modern scholars, you don't actually want to go to uh, a riba loan or an interest loan for graduate studies because at the end of the day is that you got the basis you got the basis, even if we are to consider that as a necessity, now you basically don't have a necessity for going into more riba. Um, all right, what are some practical ways to purify the diseases in our hearts and firmly attach our hearts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's actually, I believe that's the whole lecture, right? I do actually have a number of different lectures on 
um, on this topic. So if you go to my YouTube channel, A-Y-S-H-A, Aisha Wazwaz, inshallah, you'll be able to get a lot of answers. I've got a lot of YouTube videos on that. So where did you go? Any other questions before I end, inshallah? I forgot to introduce myself. Aisha Wazwaz. Done. You got more? Yes. Okay. Let's. Okay. All right. So, any other questions before I end, inshallah, and barakallah, people? One, one more right there. What would uh, you advise a mother who's trying to move her kids to Egypt? How can we parent? our kids in this society we live in today? Well, to be honest, you guys, you're not going to see me again because I'm myself moving out of the United States. I'm actually going to Malaysia because of the same exact question right here. Although born and raised in America, but unfortunately the society right now to me um, is rather too challenging for me to raise my kids in. And that's why I am doing my hijrah to Malaysia for now, you never know. Maybe I'll go to Somalia too. Who knows where? <laughs> Who knows where? So yes, I won't be staying here any longer because of that. What um, I would really recommend going to Egypt. I wish I can go to Egypt. I actually can't. It's not the safest place for me. But um, I would definitely recommend going to Egypt. They could learn their Arabi. There's the Azhar there. Great teachers. You can find great teachers there. And most importantly as well, um, you've got uh, not only great teachers, but it's also not that expensive. How can you parent um, your kids in this society that we live in today? Well, um, to be honest, I actually am always uh, making it clear that I am always announcing that public schooling are simply haram to be in. I'm straightforward. Even though I went to public schools, but public schools are haram to be in because if we continue engaging in political correctness and trying to put a Band-Aid, we're going to surprise ourselves with cancers. The reality is that the lobbies right now that are indoctrinating the students and the masses, and right now, especially Gen Z, they're right now being an easy target to the atheist, liberal, feminist, and LGBT lobbies. It has become a society, and especially here in Minnesota, it has become a society that is literally just indoctrinating our children. It has really become a scary society, so you better be careful. Wallahu al-mustahim. I know, you're like, what? Yes, I homeschooled my children, but I think it was time for me to actually give my kids the environment where they could learn their Islam, be in a society where they could get their social skills and also learn their Islam in a safe society where I don't have to keep on worrying. Are they being indoctrinated or not? Wassalamu alaikum Sayyidina Muhammad and barakallahu feekum jamiyan. Maybe somebody wants to say a question directly like that? Nobody? That's it? Go ahead, my dear. Well, there is a political reason. There are a number of different political reasons, whether it's the, the Democrats pushing it that way. A lot of money is actually generated to push the American society in where it is right now. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, you know, I definitely don't have the money to push it different, you know, in a different direction. But this did not actually start right now. This actually started you know, a uh, couple of years back and right now we're just uh, seeing it like never before, let, we, let me say, on the surface. Um, but we can't just talk about and analyzing what happened in history right now by the time that you are probably capable of doing a political change and changing things and shifting it to a different direction. You're proud, you're, you're proud, your children will probably be in their 20s. All right, this baby will probably be in her 20s. To be honest, I'll tell you, I saw the change in, um, uh, I saw the change in how America actually changed from the age when I was in sixth grade, fourth grade to 
by the time I was in high school, kids are actually talking about this in school. So what just happened in a matter of six years, by the time I was actually in university, things flipped upside down. What just happened? What just happened? Never before any lobby had actually been so subsidized, so given so much power, not even the Zionist party was as powerful as the LGBT party. Never was there any shift that fast from the 60s until now, shifting upside down to the point of even influencing the Supreme Court. This is unprecedented. What really happened, I myself am trying to really understand what just happened. How is it that the US all of a sudden just gave up on in God we trust? gave up on even what the what the founding fathers have actually founded America on in in terms of you know the Puritans and all the Christianity whatever happened on that I don't know but I definitely have to act fast before at least in my nuclear family I have to act fast before I manage to actually um, scrutinize and try to figure out what just happened politically I don't have time for that but we just have to act fast. It's, it's really sad, but um, at least we recognize what's going on. If we don't recognize what's going on and we continue using political co correctness, we're just manipulating ourselves. Wallahul Mustain. Go ahead, my dear. Is there a way? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'll send them to Safiya, inshallah. Inshallah. Go ahead, my dear. So voting in general, voting in general, it's a it's one way of making a change. Definitely, I am pro voting because that's one way of trying to contribute to make a change. Um, but unfortunately, right now, what we're seeing is that many Muslims are confusing their contribution to wanting to make a change within the society to adopting. This is important, listen to this, because to adopting, instead of recognizing that that was a tool, now we're seeing Muslims literally adopt everything about DNC. It's like at one point, they were supposedly supporting the DNC, the Democratic Party, in order to make sure that the Muslims are not being alienated and the Islamophobia is not escalating against them by the Republicans. But then what we found ourselves in is that we saw a lot of Muslims actually adopting everything that DNC stands for. They, it became their new aqidah. They started adopting feminism. They started adopting the LGBT. We started seeing Muslims that are saying that they are actually pro-LGBT. We started to Mus seeing Muslims talk about inclusivity. We started seeing Muslims that are inviting and speaking about abortion as if it is uh, something that Islam stands for. We started seeing Muslim activists that are actually invited for Iqra and Isla and all of those that are actually speaking. We in Islam is feminism and it, <laughs> what has happened? What happened is that a lot of Muslims don't recognize the difference between a tool to making a contribution to change and between their own ident identity and aqidah. If we actually say you are voting to make a contribution to change, this is one way to actually do it. But if you're then confusing all that and you're adopting feminism and you're adopting the DNC and what it stands for, just like what Ilhan Omar had done and started marching and dancing in, in their parade, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. So what is at stake is that we are really in need right now for deep awakening in the Muslim's aqidah before we even talk about politics. You cannot be politically active if you cannot even know who you are. If you don't know who you are, what are you really trying to do? 
That's where it starts. It starts with first recognizing your identity. That's what it starts with. And what we're seeing right now is that we're seeing a lot of Muslims talking about voting and talking about being active and they're actually losing their own identity. That's a problem. Be active, definitely vote. But don't adopt everything that DNC stands for. Absolutely not. What have we done? We lost our identity. You would see Linda Sarsour. I'm a Muslim, therefore I'm a feminist. The Prophet was the first feminist. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. And we're inviting them to speak. And we're actually part of it. And we had them go into the DNC and all of that. And in other words, do what? Be awakened. Don't be a mob. Islam is telling you, don't be a mob. Don't clap because everybody else is clapping. Islam is on top, on the top. No, not the DNC. And certainly not the liberals. And certainly not any party is going to teach us or be superior to Islam. Islam is superior. And no, it's not the feminists that are going to tell us what it means to de define women's rights. And certainly not the liberals either that are going to define what it means to actually adopt or embrace human rights. It's Islam. Islam is superior. We don't take it not from the liberals and certainly not from the Republicans and certainly not from the Democrats and certainly not from the West and certainly not from postmodernists and certainly not from the United Nations either. We take it from La ilaha illallah. Wallahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum. Quickly before we um, done, well, you can get done. We just have oh, okay. the announcement. Um, we want to also thank Chef for uh, Chef.